All right, so for everyone listening in on this, I'm going to introduce myself to everyone. Um, so my name is Chris Chowan, professor of finance uh, here at the university. I'm actually uh, a proud graduate of Idaho State University, uh, bachelor's and master's, and uh, currently also enrolled at the University of Florida uh, for my doctorate program. Uh, I'd like to say that I was a student athlete, um, although I did play hockey up until a few years ago. I grew up in Canada, so I do, I, I do know something about athletics, I hope. Um, but uh, I've been asked to speak tonight about uh, financial literacy. A couple of you have had me before, so hopefully nothing in here is too new. Uh, if it is, then, uh, then I failed you somewhere. And if not, it's just a repeat of stuff, so enjoy. So, you guys now have the wonderful opportunity to actually be able to profit off of your name, your image, and your likeness, okay? And uh, not get in trouble, you know, for signing autographs or certain other things. So, what I want to talk to you about is just some of those things, okay? Discussion points, this kind of doesn't have like a real, I, it's pretty much in order. The goal here is that I don't take too long because I tend to talk a lot, okay? So I want to talk obviously about profiting from your name, image, and likeness, what that means, and then some about financial literacy, a few warnings and examples, uh, taxes, unfortunately we're gonna have to talk about that, and then just financial planning for life, okay? So if first of all you're sitting here and you're saying this name, image, likeness thing doesn't concern me, I think this concerns all of us right here. If it can work. Do you have any experience? No, sir, I have no experience, but I'm a big fan of money. Hang on. I like it. It's working on my laptop, but apparently not anywhere else. So we gotta see what we can do to make that work. There we go. We'll back it up. Do you have any experience? No, sir, I have no experience, but I'm a big fan of money. I like it. I use it. I have a little. I keep it in a jar on top of my refrigerator. I'd like to put more in that jar. That's where you come in. So perhaps that could be your, uh, your recruitment when you're uh, trying to get some sponsorships or other ways of raising money, okay? Uh, if it was really hard to hear, I apologize. That's a really quiet YouTube video. Uh, but it is a line from The Wedding Singer. It's a line I often use in my personal finance class. Um, we all use money. We're all concerned with money. It's a part of our lives. So whether you're going to be able to go out and get a sponsorship now or, or be paid uh, for appearances or something else, maybe that's not going to happen, but money is going to be a part of your lives. And so I hope that at, at the very least, what we talk about today is applicable. Now I gotta unextend that. We'll get it, we'll get it to work. Technology. Ah, too many buttons. And this is just like class, isn't it? A little bit. Yeah. It's fine. Struggling with technology. You're doing great. Appreciate it. All right. Back to where we were. So, you're going to have opportunities to make money, whether that's in name, likeness, image, okay? Name, image, likeness. I messed it up there. That's okay. In your lives, you're going to be able to have money far beyond being a student athlete, okay? You're going to graduate. You're going to go on, get a full-time job. And uh, you need to know something about financial literacy. So, quick definition here. What's financial literacy? Uh, what, it, what is it that I teach here at the university? Well, it's the ability to understand and effectively use various financial skills. Okay, that includes personal financial management, budgeting, and investing. It's the foundation of your relationship with money, and it's a lifelong journey of learning. The earlier you start, the better off you'll be because education is the key to success when it comes to money. So, 
I'm not here to talk to you about how you're going to make money, but I got a couple examples here. We're going to play a little bit of guessing game through, through this presentation. Anybody know who these two are? I'm going to have to give lots of hints and that's okay. The gentleman on the left okay, is a football player at Marshall. As you can see, he's also a musician. And up until this year, when he has performed, he has had to use not his first name or his real name. Instead, he's gone by uh, Lucky Bill. Okay? And in that, he's not been able to have any kind of martial advertisement at all because that's a violation of NCAA rules. So while he may not be endorsed or receiving sponsorships at all anymore, at the very least, when he performs now with these loosened rules, he can now wear a Marshall football shirt and he can use his real name, which is Will. Okay. So no endorsement, but he can actually live a life. Uh, on the right, former football player, a backup kicker for uh, UCF. During his time at UCF, he had a YouTube channel, which he'd do tutorials on kicking. And because it made money through advertisements, he got shut down. Actually, he was given the option, surrender his scholarship and no longer be a, a full-time athlete or uh, get rid of his YouTube channel. He decided to keep his YouTube channel. This was back in 2017. So just an example of now, you know, any of you can have a YouTube channel. You don't have to worry about, is this a violation of rules? Okay. So you're able to actually live life. So bad news about financial literacy. 34% of Americans have zero dollars in savings. No money at all. 72% of households do not have a written financial plan. 66% of millennials have no retirement savings. So nothing saved at all. And 46% of Americans do not have $400 available. So 34% have nothing but even 46% total have 400 or less than 400. So if an emergency were to come up, it can't even cover a basic emergency. That's the bad news when it comes to financial literacy. The good news, well, I have a philosophy. My philosophy is that personal finance is more personal than it is finance. And that's not my own philosophy. A lot of people feel this way meaning that there's no one-size-fits-all financial plan. Also, stop me anytime and ask me questions, or just give me a break from talking. Okay. Um, so, basically, there's no cookie cutter, you do this, do that, you know, we're all the same. No, we're all different. Okay. We all have different spending habits, we all have different uh, income levels that we desire. So all of our financial plans are going to be different. So who's going to define whether or not you're successful? Well, you will. Okay. You get to decide what financial success looks like to you. Starting earlier, meaning starting earlier to think about your future, your finances, retirement even, will lead to less headaches later. So that bad news, right? All right, we're going to do it here. We're going to do it over. 72% okay. of households have no written financial plan, meaning no budget, no sense of what they're doing with their finances, no goals. The good news is that 83% of people that set financial goals, so people that choose to make a financial goal, choose to have some type of a plan, they feel better about their finances after just one year. That's what we all want. Because the last thing that any of us want is to be worrying about how we're going to make ends meet. Okay. Doesn't matter if you're a college student. Doesn't matter if you're, you know, five, ten years into your career. Doesn't matter if you've got a family. Doesn't matter if you're at retirement. Okay. None of us want to be worrying about how we're going to make ends meet. So thinking about it now okay. leads to less headaches later. Okay. Making financial goals now when you're a poor college student is going to lead to not having to work part-time. I often use the example of my father. 
Uh, one of the reasons I love financial planning is because I saw how my parents failed to prepare and my father had to work long after he was forced to retire. And he had to go out because he couldn't physically work but then had to take a part-time job. And the only reason they survived is because his mother passed away and left a little bit of money. And I always say, if your financial plan is hoping somebody dies, it's a bad financial plan. Okay? So don't plan that way. Okay? Questions? I'm going to stop and take a drink now. Nothing? Okay. Some warnings. This is where we get to play guessing games again. Okay. Warning number one. Who can you trust? Okay. Unfortunately, there's a lot of bad eggs out there. Okay. Sometimes wondering who you can trust, trust with your money, okay, can be tough. Because okay. no one's going to care mu as much about your finances as you actually do. No one cares as much about you as you do. So, here's our, our guessing game. Do we know who this is? It's a little bit before your time, but this is an image from probably the best, the best college football championship I've ever seen in my life. 2006, okay, Texas and USC, Texas won. This is Vince Young. Okay. Vince Young, at the time, 2006 did not have the opportunity to profit off of his name, his image, and his likeness, but believe me, would have been able to. Okay, as we're seeing many of the top quarterbacks at some of the top schools making big deals. But he did go on to the NFL, and in his career, between playing earnings and endorsements, he earned over 60 million dollars. Quite a bit of money, right? We could all do well with 60 million. Okay. Well, unfortunately, Vince filed for bankruptcy. And why? Well, he admits to some poor spending habits, but he also claims that his financial advisor stole money from him and misappropriated funds, leading to poor investments and a loss of a lot of that income. So who can you trust? Well, whoever he trusted, obviously did not serve him well. So being very careful when you're looking for a financial advisor or somebody to advise you on these things, asking around. I mean, how many of us, uh, before we go eat at a new place, will look at the Google reviews? I know I do. So before taking financial advice from somebody, we might want to ask some questions. We might want to look in some reviews. We might want to just meet with them initially and get a feel. Do our goals align? Because okay? no one's going to care as much as you do. And unfortunately, doesn't matter if they've got a designation behind their name. I've got CPA behind my name. Okay? I'm a professor. I'm up here right now talking about financial literacy. But should you just accept everything I say? I mean, you should probably take it with some skepticism. Okay. Is that a question, or yes, do you just think question. you should think, you believe everything I say? Yes, yeah, absolutely. No. Okay. Okay. Well, okay, I went off. But I'm going to ask my question now. Okay, please. Um, what kind of questions would you ask someone if you're like going to like talk with them about, like, what kind of questions would you ask a financial advisor if you were going to meet with them? That's a fantastic question. Um, by the way, I'm also a former advisor, a uh, financial planner. So. I think one of the first questions you can always ask is how they're paid. Because as a financial advisor, there's a couple of different ways that they can get paid. They can get paid uh, essentially like a commission to where they can get paid for all of the investments they put you in. This can be bad because for them, it doesn't necessarily matter if the investment does well or not. They get paid the commission for selling it to you. So this typically falls under what's called a, a good enough arrangement. They just have to show that it's suitable for you and your investment risk and everything else. Uh, you can also have what's called a fiduciary, and that's going to be the much better financial advisor. So a fiduciary has 
a legal responsibility to look out for your best interest. Typically, they are paid a percentage of the assets that they manage for you. So for example, they might charge 1% of however much money they're managing for you. So as your money grows, so does the amount of money they make. Okay? And as your money goes down, you know, down with markets, et cetera, so does how much they make. So again, interests are aligned there. And then usually with a fiduciary, they're also looking beyond just what investment to put you in. They're making sure that all your financial aspects are taken care of. So working with an accountant to make sure tax planning is taking place. Working with an insurance agent to make sure you've got your insurance needs covered. Uh, I think you're, I think it's fair game too to ask what they invest in. Uh, my mentor had always told me, don't be afraid to show your portfolio what you actually are invested in to your clients because they want to know that you're living by what you preach as well. So I think those are good questions. Question order? Actually, I figured you probably might cover it, but I was just going to say how soon like, it in your life is it a good idea to get a financial advisor? So that's a tough question. And here's why I'm going to say it's a tough question. Because the best advisors, right, are going to be the, the fiduciaries that are usually getting paid a percentage of what they manage. And unfortunately, because of that, they're usually, yeah, they're usually managing big clients, right? And so unfortunately, you're kind of left with those that are starving for clients, and they'll take anybody, and they'll try and get, sell you products so that they make money. It, it's, it's a really tough, tough game. So... Um, one of the things, and, and this is by no means a hard, fast rule, but there's a big push with, with CPAs, with, with accountants, certified public accountants, um, to have a financial planning background. So, like, for example, through the AICPA, which is the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, uh, there's a PFS designation, which is a personal financial specialist. Uh, because they're trying to kind of, hey, we're doing your taxes, let us help you with this as well, and bring everything into play. So having a really good accountant that either has a background in the financial, because we're all going to need accounts. I mean, uh, it's just wise, I think, to have an accountant. And that's one of those things that, you know, it's okay to pay a one-time rate to or an hourly rate to. Um, so if they have a good background in it, or at the very least, if they have a good connection so they could pro provide you with some education or lean you towards somebody who can. But I think it's, it never hurts to start too early. But that's where, I, that's a great question because you gotta be careful that you're not just getting the guy that I'll take anyone and everyone because I gotta feed my family. And it's a tough world. I mean, good financial planners, they have big clients and that's how they survive. So, a good question. So what would be the minimum to start looking at a financial plan? I mean, do you have to walk in there with $15,000? Do you have to walk in there with $10,000? It's, it's gonna depend. Now, every firm is a little bit different, right? And usually they might have like some junior <coughs> associates that will take smaller clients. So for example, I mean, the firm that I work for, um, we got to a point that we had so many clients that all our new clients that we were taking on had a million dollars. You know, it, just because you come to that point that you're, you just can't take on, on anyone new. But we were also at a point that at the time that, that I left, um, we were starting to talk about kind of having a smaller section that I would manage or clients I would manage or having another advisor on where we might take smaller clients like maybe starting 50,000. 50, 50 so, five zero? Yes, five zero. But that's not every shop, and hopefully, hopefully too, um, through this presentation or because uh, I'll talk briefly about it, or through uh, through personal finance that you can come take with me, um, I'll give you enough information that you could kind of start on your own as far as how do I start building wealth. There's also now a lot of what are called robo-advisors. So these are online advisors where you don't actually meet with anyone, but you'll be asked like a, a questionnaire. So, you know, what's your risk tolerance? So they'll ask you a lot of questions to figure out 
what kind of risk appetite you're comfortable with, um, what your retirement goals are, like when you want to retire, how much you're able to save. And then it will, you'll be able to set it up so that you can have automatic investing into it and it'll diversify it. Um, so like Betterment, B-E-T-T-E-R-M-E-N-T -E -E is one of those. So you're not actually working with an advisor. You're only getting investment management, but it's, in my opinion, it's much better than what you're going to get from someone that's, you know, you should invest in this, you know, whatever the next hot stock is, and because they're going to get paid a commission. So, so there's at least options. So if you, if we're like poor college kids, you'd say realistically it's better to go with those online ones for now versus going with like a live financial. Yes, if you feel like you can't do it your own, because I, I would tell you with a little bit of back, a little bit of study into low cost diversified index funds, right? We talked about that uh, in personal finance. Um, you could open an account at Vanguard, for example, and invest in a low cost Vanguard index fund that's going to be well diversified. That's my whole philosophy of buy everything. Well, it invests in a lot of stuff. Hold it forever. Okay? Don't try and time the market and buy and sell and buy and sell. And then don't look at it because you're going to go crazy. Because if there's a drop because the economy's in the tank, then you're going to panic. And if things are really cooking, then you're going to wonder you know, why you didn't invest more. And if that's outside your realm of, of possibility or budget, you can get in some trouble there. So so I think a robo-advisor at the very least is a good place to start if you don't want to take it on yourself. And by taking it on yourself, I mean investing. I've got a slide in here that kind of talks about the difference between investing and, and uh, gambling, that's what I call it. Mm -hmm. so, which is getting Robin Hood on your phone and just guessing at something. But good questions. I can just take questions all day. Other questions? Okay, we're gonna have another guessing game then. Mind your habits. Okay, anybody know who this guy is? No hockey fans in here. This is Evander Kane. Okay, used to play for the San Jose Sharks. As you can see, he's got a gambling problem. Evander Kane, despite currently making $6 million a year, has just filed for bankruptcy at the beginning of 2021. Okay. And now he's also under investigation by the NHL because his estranged wife claims that he was also betting on his own games and throwing them. But he declared bankruptcy because of gambling debts. Okay. So, mind your habits. Okay. You come into a lot of money, you've got to be careful. Okay. Uh, something in uh, behavioral economics we call cognitive bias, also known as overconfidence. Okay, anybody know these two? Before your time, but a little bit, a little bit more well known. On the right, Dan Marino. On the left, Kurt Schilling. This is from the infamous 2004 Bloody Sock game. Okay, you can go Google it. Okay. Um, so these two. Okay. So athletes, right? You guys are athletes. Probably have supreme confidence in your skills. Okay? And that's a good thing. That's a fantastic thing, to be confident in your abilities. Okay? These two, two of the best to ever play their sport. Okay? Extremely confident, but their confidence also led them to some poor investments okay? because of their confidence. Kurt Schilling here was so confident in video games that he started a video game company, pouring 50 million of his own money into it. That video game company no longer exists. He lost 50 million dollars. In fact, things got so bad that this bloody sock here, okay, that he wore, he had to sell it to try and raise money to keep his company going. Okay, because people buy that memorabilia. And then Dan Marino invested in a hologram uh, company. So several years ago at uh, Coachella, there was a performance with a hologram image of Tupac Shakur. And that was the company that 
that Dan Marino invested in. And not long after that performance, the company went bankrupt. He lost $14 million in it, okay, because he was one of the original investors. So be careful of your confidence leading you to be overconfident in something. Okay? So be careful. That's all I got to say there. All right. So what does making money mean? This is a general question. This is a question for all of you guys. In fact, let's just do this. This is a question I, I'll often ask. What's important about money to you? So somebody think about that. And if I have a volunteer. The amount that you have? Is that what's important to you? Or is that which, how you're interpreting the question? I think it's how I'm interpreting the question. Okay, so let me just ask you this question directly then. What's important about money to you? I think it's one same answer, how much I have. How much you have, okay. How much I can spend. So this, this is something that in my practice, in our practice, I say my practice, I was, just, I was just a guy there. I learned from some of the best. But this is what we do. We'd sit down with a potential client, we'd ask that question, okay, what's important about money to you? And he said, well, how much I have, okay. Well, what's important about having money then? Being able to invest it and make more money. Okay. Why is it important to be able to invest it and make more money? So I can gain wealth and make more money. So that's a good answer. Why is it important to have wealth? So I don't have to work a nine to five. And why does uh, not working nine to five, like what does that look like? That just sounds awful. So working nine to five sounds awful. So yeah. not working nine to five sounds wonderful. Yeah, sure does. And uh, what do you see yourself doing in that moment? Uh, traveling, probably. Okay. And why is traveling important? Because <laughs> I like seeing the world and seeing new cultures. So are you getting uncomfortable yet with these I with the like drilling of the questions? Yeah, I just keep going. <laughs> yeah. So literally, I I can keep going on this, and the reason is. I want to drill down to exactly why, like what, what is the function of money in your life? And it sounds like seeing cultures, traveling, like is really high up there. Now we could keep drilling and I could find out all kinds of other stuff. But unless you understand why money is important to you, because the most common answer you get is, well, security. All right, well, what does security look like? I don't know, I'm not having to worry about are my kids going to eat? Okay. Why is that important? You know, and I've had situations where we do this, and you find out that you know you might have uh, an executive that you know spent her entire life just working, okay, because money was that focus, and then something triggered, and it was like, well, actually, I really want to have a family, so I've been working like really hard to try and get ahead because I want to have kids, and it kind of triggers that moment of, oh, okay, well, what change do I make here? Or, uh, you know, I've had a person that financial stability and security for the family was so important because when they grew up, they didn't have that. And they were the very first person in their family to go to college. And so they wanted to make sure that their kids all had that. So money, like I said, you might not sign a single endorsement deal, and that's okay. But money is going to be a part of your lives. I mean, it's just a function. So understanding money and why it's important to you is going to be important. Now, what happens when you make money? You get to keep it all? No. No. I don't have time to teach you everything there is to know about taxes. I don't have time to teach myself everything there is to know about taxes. It's like this long, and I've studied it for the last 12 years. But in the United States, we use a progressive tax system, ranges from 10% to 37% currently. I'll show what that means in a minute. But everyone is entitled to a standard deduction. That standard deduction is basically tax-free income. Okay? And so I'll just use for a single person. Okay? It's going to be different if you're married, or it's different if you're unmarried but have a kid. But just for a single person, that's 12550 for the current tax year. Okay. Essentially what that means is 
you get $12,550 tax free. Okay. State, oh wait, wait, let me, let me explain the brackets first, okay? Because I always get questions on this. How the progressive system works, because there's a lot of confusion. Okay. This first bracket here you can see is 10% of taxable income between zero and 9,950, okay? So essentially what that means remember I get 12,550 that's tax free. So if total, what is that? Uh, 126. Oh my heck, I can't do math in my head right now. 10,000. So it's basically about 22,500. Okay? So if I made $22,500, 12,550 that's tax free. And the rest of that all falls in this 10% bracket. So I pay 10% tax on that 9,950. So that's a total of 995 bucks federal tax, even though I made 20, 20 plus. Okay. Now if I made more, then everything above the 9,950 falls into the next bracket, but only what's in that bracket. Okay. So what falls in the next bracket taxed at 12%. So essentially, if my total tax, taxable income was let's say 40,000, okay? So in total I made about 52 grand, right? I get that first 12, five that's tax free. And then the rest, okay, a big chunk falls in here and then a smaller chunk in here. So I basically pay 995 bucks plus 12% of anything over 99.50. That's how the progressive tax brackets work. Okay? And I only explain that because a lot of people get confused and think, well, how much can I make before I'm in the next bracket? Because there's confusion that if I pop into a bracket, then all my money's taxed at that. And that's not how we work, okay? Just the amount in each bracket. And again, this is just the single brackets. So if you are married, or if you are single, but you have a kid, uh, there's different filing statuses and brackets. So just showing information on how the system works. But bottom line, if you're single, you can make 12,550 federal, before you owe any tax. Now every state's different, and many of the athletes listening are from different states, okay? So consult again your tax professional. But here in Idaho, we follow the same standard deduction as the federal. Okay? Idaho's tax system is somewhat, fam somewhat familiar, somewhat uh, the same as the federal. So basically, if, if I'm a resident of Idaho, and all my income was earned in Idaho, and in total I made $10,000 this year, which if I'm a student, student athlete, I mean, that's, that's a lot of money, because you've been in school and everything else. That's below the standard deduction, so I owe no federal and no state tax. I don't pay any taxes. But, in red, income tax, that's income tax I don't pay. What I do pay is FICA tax. Okay, so this is back to our payroll tax. So for any of you that have worked a job, been paid as an employee, okay, or if you currently are, look at your pay stub, okay, or think back to your pay stub. And on your pay stub, you probably noticed, might have just said SS tax, might have said med tax, they might have had them both lumped together as FICA. Okay. But bottom line, is there's a total of 7.65% of your paycheck that disappeared. So if, if you get paid $10 an hour and you work 10 hours in a week, that's 100 bucks, but that's not what you're taking home because $7.65 is gonna disappear. Your employer has to take that out before they give you your check. And what most of you probably don't know is your employer has to turn around and match that out of their pocket. So that's a total of 15.3%. Now why am I talking about this? The reason I'm talking about this is any payments you receive as a contractor, remember, you're essentially your own boss and your own, you're the employee. Okay? Your company is you. If you get paid as a contractor, you're gonna be responsible for these FICA taxes. 
both the employee portion and the match from the employer, which means 15.3% of your profit is gonna get paid in tax. So what does this mean? Let's say you get paid $10,000. We've already discussed no federal and no state income tax. But 15.3% FICA tax. And that's not automatically withheld. You're gonna get a check and you're gonna have to know to be responsible for this. So I bring that up because if you happen to get paid 10 grand, you better hold at least 1,500 of it because you're gonna have to pay taxes. So if you get paid, make sure you're planning for it. Make sure you're working with your tax professional. Questions on taxes? Yes? So for maybe using like this stuff, you're technically a contractor, but what if you have a deal where they're not paying you monetarily, but you're receiving like, like, Like free food or merchandise. Yeah. Okay, so technically, okay, technically anything you receive, it has to be claimed. So the value of the food, the value of merchandise, technically should be claimed. Now, I mean, maybe we shouldn't record me saying that, so I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm just going to say that technically, if that needs to be claimed. It's the same with like barter transaction. Like if I do somebody's taxes um, and in return they uh, cut my hair, so technically I have to claim the value of the service that was provided as income because it was given to me. Um, but it's, I mean, it's a, it's a tough, I mean, who, who does that? I mean, that's a tough... How could they track it? Yeah, well... <laughs> you can get away with anything you want until you get caught. Right. Okay? So, an example I didn't put up here for tax evasion was Al Capone. Okay? So, Al Capone was a terrible gangster. Al Capone went to jail for tax evasion because he didn't pay taxes on the illegal income that he earned from bootlegging and everything else, and racketeering. But, so technically any income you earn and any value of anything you're given has to, it has to be claimed as income. Now, are they reporting it? I doubt it. How do you report it? I have never reported that for any of my clients, so I would not be the expert on that. So I apologize. And I. I mean, I don't, I don't want, I'm not going to record myself telling you not to do that, but I'll leave that to you. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a strange situation, but it's like if you go on a game show and you went on a car, that gets recorded as income. They'll actually send you a 1099 and that, they'll send you this, okay, for basically like value of what you were given. So if whoever you work that deal out with does that, which they might, because I would think that they would want to write off whatever they're giving you, then you're gonna have a form to be able to claim it. If not, keep good records and work with a tax advisor. Consult your tax professional. That's my, that's my legal answer. That's a good question. Other questions? Now, if they do pay you in cash, too, they're going to give you this form. So a 1099, if anybody ever pays you more than $600, okay, or if the value of what they give you is more than $600, they should be giving you this. Now, if the value is less than $600, they technically don't have to give this to you. Now, again, technically, you do have to report it. But as far as self-employment income goes, if it's less than $400, you actually don't have, have a legal requirement to report it on taxes. So if you get four hundred dollars worth of food, you're good. Okay, and is that like all at once or is it like over like a year? Over the tax year. Okay. Yeah, so if it's one company that does it, uh, then if a total of six hundred over the year, then they give it to you. Now if you got like five different companies and each is doing two hundred bucks, they might not give you one. 
But again, if you've got five different companies and each one's 200, that's a thousand bucks. That's over the $400 limit. You technically have to report that. Now, you're not going to go to jail like Al Capone did. Okay. But I'm just going to tell you keep good records and consult with a tax professional. This is going to get shown to somebody and I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> You haven't said anything wrong. <laughs> Other questions? Because that's a great question. Okay, so that's the 1099, right? This is what you get if you're a contractor. Now, if you work as an employee, you've probably seen this report, you get a W-2. Okay? The W-2 reports how much you were paid and it reports the FICA taxes that were withheld, Social Security and Medicare tax. Okay. As you can see on here, it just says, yeah, non-employee compensation, you know, here's an example. Nowhere on there, I mean, they have a space for federal income tax withheld, but nobody withholds this for you. I've never in my career seen a company, now it doesn't mean they don't exist, but it's so rare that the company would be like, oh, for our contractor, let us withhold this tax for you. No, they, that's why they pay you as a contractor, because they don't want the responsibility. So, keep that in mind. Get paid. I hope you sign huge deals. All of you. And then consult your tax professional. All right. Good? Those taxes. We're, we all love taxes, right? Yeah. Yes. I love that enthusiasm. So. All right. So, my favorite part of all of it personal finance. Financial planning. Well, if personal finance is more personal than it is finance, then it is also something else. You guys know what it is? Really boring <laughs> if it's done right. Okay? Like, people think finance, okay? And they think, oh, you know, it's, it's what I see in movies, right? It's glamorous, it's, it's Wall Street, and it's the big short, and it's Wolf of Wall Street, and all these crazy things. Look, financial planning, okay, investment management, in my opinion, if done right, is so extremely boring and not glamorous and not sexy in any way. Like, it's just, here it is. Well, let me put all my money in a low cost well-diversified index fund, and I'll touch it 40 years from now, and actually really enjoy it, and be able to travel and see the world, okay? That's when it becomes exciting and glamorous. But all the what, leading up to it, not really. Like we talk about things like savings education, budget, credit education, like that's not glamorous, okay? But it should be, okay? Saving for a rainy day, remember that bad news, okay? 44% of Americans don't have 400 bucks, meaning like in their bank account, $400. If I'm driving home today and I blow a tire on my car and I'm wondering tomorrow how I'm gonna make it into work, 44% of Americans don't have the money to be able to replace that tire to get to their job, which means they're scrambling, putting it on a credit card, begging, stealing, or borrowing from family and friends. Okay? You don't want that to be you. Okay? So how do we make it so it's not? Well, make simple goals. Okay? Set up automatic savings if that's possible. Okay? If you work, okay? talk to your payroll department. It's probably possible to have your paycheck put into two different accounts where you could say, you know what? Put 90% of it into my checking and put 10% into my savings. And then it just becomes automatic. Because nothing's easier than having something set up automatic, out of sight, out of mind. Because if instead you get your paycheck and you're like, well, if I have anything left, I'll save. But you know, the world starts to open back up and now there's concerts and fun stuff to be done. And so before you know it, there's nothing left. And so making it automatic, if it's possible, and just having simple savings goals. And I'm talking that's just your short-term emergency fund, okay? To be able to access, to pay the bills. We're not even talking about retirement savings here. 
but we should. I mean, that needs to be said. Okay? Budgeting. Most people think the budget is a dirty word. Any of you guys think that? None of, nobody in here, though, right? There's a few of you that are listening to this. That are like, that's not a dirty word. That's a four-letter word. Okay? Budget is a wonderful word. Okay? It's, not, it's not a limitation on what you can do with your money. Okay? It, I encourage you to think of it as an opening up or a freedom. It frees up money for the things that you love. Budgeting allows you to decide what is it I really want to spend money on? Okay? And maybe what is it I want to save on beyond just the emergency account? Okay? But what do I want to save on? Okay. So, what do I love? I, I brought this not just because, uh, well, mind your habits, right? I already showed that slide. I'm definitely addicted to soda. But I didn't just bring it because I wanted a drink. I brought it because like the worst thing that's ever happened to me is soda barn opening up like right across the street okay. because I found myself spending a lot of money there so what did I do well I decided I really liked it so I put it into my budget I love the Toronto Blue Jays but I'm definitely out of market so I don't get to watch those games on TV so what have I done I budgeted for the MLB subscription and I love personal finance so much that I'm here right now, instead of watching the Jays game, and trying not to watch the alerts that keep going off on my watch to see what the score is. But these are things I love. Do I go without them? I'll, I'll, I, I always tell my class, my personal finance course, okay? don't surrender. Like You don't have to go without things. Okay? You just have to know how you're going to pay for it. Now, that might mean hey, you know what, right now things are tight, I can't afford to go to the soda barn every day, or hey, right now things are tight, maybe this year, can't do the MLB subscription. Like, life, life happens. And as students, I understand that too. As a student, I would buy the generic brand Dr. Pepper, okay? Because I didn't want to go without Dr. Pepper, but it was cheaper. I budgeted. So I budget for things I love. Budget for the things you love, okay? Budget for travel, okay? See the world. You should, and there's no reason you can. Now, steps to creating a budget. Okay. Well, step one, and actually this is before you actually even sit down to do the budget. This is something we talk about personal finance. Okay. So, first thing, you gotta have an understanding of what you spend on, and we call this a spending journal, so just tracking your spending. So this is how I discovered how much I was spending at the soda barn is because I went through my bank transactions and saw, holy cow, I sure spent a lot of money there that month. Why did I do that? Okay. We also call this a little leak. Okay. Are there things that just keep popping up? Is it your morning Starbucks? Okay. Is it uh, something from the vending machine? Okay. Is it when you go into Maverick, you always see right there in the middle aisle, like the candy bars that are currently on sale. I had a student once, he's like, that's my little leak. Every time I get gas, I go in there, and it doesn't matter what it is. If it's on sale and it's in the middle, I buy it. <laughs> okay. No reason you can't budget for that. So, once you know what you actually spend on, it gives you an idea of how much you actually need to live. Like, it would make no sense for me to sit down and make a budget and just be like, I don't know, like 200 bucks for groceries. Well, I've got four kids. I mean, there's six of us. So I actually have to know about how much we're spending to make a realistic budget. So that you do before you sit down. And then once you sit down for the budget, you gotta know how much you're working with, so your income, okay? Then you gotta know your fixed expenses. So these are things like your rent, your car payment. So things that are relatively the same every month, okay? relatively the same time of month, of the month, so my rent's due the first, my car payment's due the fifth, you know, whatever it might be. So you can't change these easily. I mean, I can decrease how much I pay in rent, but the only way to do that is to move or take on a roommate. I don't get to negotiate that with the landlord. And then variable expenses, so these are things like my soda budget. Okay. 
my MLB subscription, groceries, clothing, things that I can easily adjust as needed. And then looking forward to any kind of extraordinary items that might come up. I got a couple slides, it'll take a long time, so stop me anytime. Otherwise, we'll just kind of keep going. Okay, personal credit and credit cards. And following a budget just helps you avoid unnecessary debt. And you don't want to get swallowed up by credit card debt. Um, I actually think the credit cards are a great thing okay, if used properly. That's the key. There's a lot of things that are both good and bad when used incorrectly. Okay. Credit cards can be a great thing, okay, but you, when you use it, you've got to have a plan of how you're going to pay it off. So for example, if I've got a budget, my wife and I, we've got our budget on how much we're going to spend each month on gas. Well, we have the cash for that budget. But all of our gas, it goes on our Costco credit card. Because Costco gives me 4% cash back. Okay? That's not a bad use of my credit card because it gets paid off every single month. Now, if you're like, I got no way to pay off the credit card, or I'm not good at tracking that, then maybe not, maybe not using a credit card is the best thing. But that's something you have to decide. Again, it's not glamorous. It's boring. It's budgeting. It's talking about your money. It's saving instead of spending. But it's also saving and spending on those things that you do want. All right, avoid things that are too good to be true. Okay. This is where I say beware of the difference between investing and gambling. And the examples I use here, Robin Hood. I hate Robin Hood. If you're not familiar with what Robin Hood is, I say great. I would prefer not to talk about it. Robin Hood is a trading app that you can have on your phone. Okay. It allows you to buy and sell stocks. I hate it because it's designed more like a video game than it is like an investing tool. Too many people download it, they get caught up in the fireworks and the balloons going off when they sign up and the free share of stock that they get given and, and then the news alerts that they get of what's happening. And all it does is swallow up your time and it leads you to just make uninformed decisions, in my opinion, okay? Look no further than the GameStop pandemonium, which if anybody heard about what happened with GameStop, and still, to some extent, it's going off. I'm not going to talk too much about it. I'm happy to talk with anyone about it. Um, but bottom line here, avoid these things that are too good to be true. Avoid just buying something because you hear about it, or that seems like the cool thing, or, hey, I really like their product, so they must be a good company. Instead, I say be content with average. Okay? So here's my sports analogies. Okay? So uh, in the NBA, this was uh, last year, I believe. Okay. So average field goal percentage, 46.6. Average three-point field goal percentage, 36.7. And average uh, free throw percentage, 88.4. That one seemed a little high to me, so I had to double check it. But these are team averages. Um, would anybody in here not be content with that? Like if you're, I don't, I don't have any, bas the basketball players are all, watching this hopefully after. If that were your stat line, pretty good. I'm gonna look, yeah, you're former former basketball player. But baseball, okay, the average over the years, league average, okay, 250, that means I only hit the ball one out of every four at-bats. One out of every four. Anybody in here be upset with just being an average major leaguer? Okay. And by no means the average in golf, but if you went out and shot par every day, would you be happy? Yeah. Yeah, I'd be ecstatic. Okay. Now, a professional? Okay, maybe not. But be content with average is what I say. Now, I would normally show a clip in here, but it's like eight minutes long. And I already feel like I'm taking too much time. So I'm going to tell you, get on YouTube. Okay? There's a fabulous channel. It's called Two Cents. It's a husband and wife. Uh, lots of wonderful advice on all things personal finance. They've got one about exchange traded funds. Okay? Because investing, okay, if done right, is really, really boring. Okay? It's buying everything, it's holding it forever, and it's not looking at it. 
okay? not going crazy with the ups and downs of the market. Okay? I work in finance, I teach finance, I research in finance, I got no clue what the stock market did today, yesterday, or the day before. And, and by that I mean it's Monday today, so Friday and Thursday. Because I do know it wasn't open yesterday. I at least know that much. Why? Because it doesn't concern me. Now, I'm not going to go crazy on something that doesn't concern me and my future 20 years from now. Okay. The U.S. total stock market has not been negative during a single 15-year rolling period. That's what this looks like. Okay. This is the bottom here. So rolling periods means if I take, if I start right now, this year, and I take the previous 15 years, that's a 15-year period. And if I step back one year and take those 15 years, that's a 15-year period, and step back and those 15. So every 15-year rolling period is represented right here. Okay. Not a single 15-year period has had an average annual return less than zero. The very worst 15-year period was 3.6%, I believe, 3.7% per year. Not great, but that included, that was uh, these previous 15 years, that included the financial crisis of 2008, uh, and it included 2001, so it was the 15 years ending in uh, 17, I believe, well, 16. But still average 3.7 per year. The worst 20, or excuse me, the, yeah, the worst 20 year period was 6.4% per year. Some years high, some years very low, okay? That's what this is, the one years, okay? The reds are negative, you see that's really bad, that's good, that's bad for three years, okay? Nobody can accurately predict which year's gonna be good, which year's gonna be bad, but if you got long enough, which if you start early, you do, then just be content with average. Okay. Now, if all you had was 15 years and it happened to be the worst 15 years and it was 3.7, that's not fantastic. But it's a whole heck of a lot better than if you don't start at all or you happen to start in 2007 when everything's climbing and you're like, well, I'm retiring in the next couple of years. I guess I better start throwing all my money into the market. And then it crashes the next year. So be in it for the long haul. All right, so I'm gonna end with this, okay? Whether you're making money now or later, just remember these. Be careful who you trust, and okay? nobody cares as much about your money as you do. Be wise in the use of your resources, okay? save, budget. Don't overextend yourself by going too far into debt. Okay? There's some good debts. Like sometimes buying a house is wise. Don't just buy a house because that's what everybody's doing. Think through it. It's the thing for you. Okay, conquer your immediate gratification. Okay. Don't forget about taxes. And if any of you get paid as a contractor, you got to remember FICA taxes, and that's what's going to hurt you. I've seen a lot of clients get burned by that. Uh, you can't get rich quick. Now, yes, but so and so did. Yeah, sometimes it happens, and sometimes people get lucky. The vast majority. Okay. Do not get rich quick. But you know what you can get really fast? You can get broke really fast. Okay. By trusting the wrong people. By being overconfident. By taking unnecessary risks. Wise, prudent, value-based investing for the long term. Okay. And I showed some examples of uh, some warnings. So I got so some good examples. Okay. Anybody 